Hello and welcome to Coronavirus Q&A. Confused you might be. On tonight's programme, we'll try to get you some clarity on some of the changes happening over the next few days and weeks. Robert Jenrick, the government's Communities Secretary and what you can and can't now do. Dr Sarah Jarvis on what it all means for those who are still shielded and when you should be covering your face. Chris Choi on your rights as the lockdown eases in England. And we meet the hairdresser managing to work from home. How does she do it? Here's how you can get in touch so we can get answers to all of your questions. Lots of changes in the past 24 hours and in the last hour, we've heard the latest on the lockdown rules for England from the Prime Minister. We've set out the first three steps we will take carefully to modify the measures gradually ease the lockdown and begin to allow people to return to their way of life. The government wants you to go back to work if you can't work from home, but wants you to avoid public transport if you can. If you do need to travel on the trains, tubes and buses, people across England should now wear face coverings. From Wednesday, you'll be able to meet one person from a different household, friend or family in an outdoor space like a park, keeping a two metre distance. And you'll be able to spend more time outdoors doing things like sunbathing or having a picnic. If you live in England, masks at the ready, some return to work, some changes to who you can meet outdoors, but it's still stay at home for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Let's find out why and what the changes might mean for you. In the last hour, I spoke to the Communities Secretary, Robert Jenrick. Robert Jenrick, our first question comes from Jackie, who asks, why can I sit in a park or even go to work, but not socially distance with my close family who haven't seen anyone for eight weeks? Well, good evening. The, the guidance we're publishing today will say that from Wednesday, you are able to go outside more often, so you're not limited to just once a day. And when you go to the park or other public spaces, you can sit on a bench or uh, lie on the grass and speak to somebody from outside your household. It's just one person and you should be two metres apart. I appreciate it's frustrating for some that they can't go to a family member's home and sit in the garden there or even enter the home. But this is just the first phase. We hope if we can keep the infection under control and we may be able to ease even further in the weeks ahead. But this is a first step, I think, mm -hmm. in the right direction of making life easier and enabling people to have a bit more contact with people outside of their households. Why parks but not people's gardens though? They're both outdoors, especially if we think about front gardens rather than back ones. Well, we've chosen to do it in parks because they're uh, public, open spaces. Uh, we don't think there'll be very much um, uh, bending of the rules in public spaces. And it enables people to have some exercise, take kids and other members of their household out and if they do come into contact with somebody who they know they're able to stop even sit down and have a conversation with them as long as it's socially distanced it isn't something as pre-planned or as um, uh, as something that brings them into contact as much as going to a close family member or friend's house sitting in the garden having lunch having a cup of coffee in the garden but that's something that we would like to see but it's going to take some time before we get to that. And so that may be possible in the next phase. OK, lots of questions about travelling around England. Margium says, we live in Frinton-on-Sea and are now expecting that hundreds of people will be flocking here to the beach. That puts our area more at risk. What's your response to her? How much are we now relying on people and their common sense? Well, applying common sense is absolutely critical to this. And so far, people have generally adhered to the guidelines and shown personal responsibility. And that's critical because if people keep doing that, 
then we can keep that rate of infection under control, control the virus, and enable us to move forward onto the next phase and further opening up of the economy and of our everyday lives. We're saying to people that uh, they can get in the car with their own household, go for a drive, perhaps into the countryside, perhaps to the local beach, uh, and go for a walk there. But when they're there, they should socially distance. So they shouldn't come into close proximity to other people. They shouldn't congregate, uh, but they can get that bit of fresh air. And that's important because if you remember, the lockdown has affected all of us, but not all of us equally. So many people have been in cramped accommodation, in flats, perhaps with kids, and will really welcome the opportunity to get out into the countryside or to beaches. But they've got to behave responsibly if that's going to be sustainable. We are providing advice to councils on how they can manage some of those outdoor spaces, particularly beaches, and ensure that people do follow those rules. And day trips to beaches further away, yes or no? There's no limit to how far you can travel. Obviously, we think it's fairly unlikely, given that you won't be able to stay for the moment in hotels or B&Bs, that people will travel very long distances. But we haven't put a time limit All on right. that. So okay. that will be at people's own individual discretion, how far okay. they want to travel. On this uh, big key issue of returning to work, uh, Joe asks, what should workers forced to return to work do if their employers ignore distancing guidelines? Well, look, we want people who can't work from home to return to the workplace, but to return safely. And we've published today detailed guidance we've worked through with the medical experts at Public Health England and elsewhere as to how those settings can be done safely. It's really important that people feel confident to return to work. So I'd urge people to look on gov.uk to read some of that advice if they're nervous. And Robert, sorry to interrupt. To, if they don't, talk to what their do employers. they need to do? And what, what, what if the, if, the if employer says, you've got to come to work and we haven't quite fixed social distancing, what, what should they then well, do? Well, employers continue to owe the duty to their employees to look after them and to treat them well. And so those workplaces must be safe. If they're concerned, then they should raise this as they would do normally with the employer, with health and safety. The health and safety executive have been given extra money from government so they can manage that and take up complaints. Seriously, talk to trade unions, all the things you would normally do if you're worried about going to work. And you shouldn't feel pressurized to go back to work if you have genuine concerns that your employer isn't following the guidance. So take okay. a look at it, report concerns if you have them. OK, a quick one from Mariam. Uh, she's in London. She asks, if I'm expected to return to work, will the Prime Minister remove parking restrictions so I can drive to work and park for free? Well, that's a matter for local councils uh, who generally control those. Councils have taken action, for example, uh, waiving car parking charges for health and uh, social care workers in many cases, but that's a matter for them to take up. Obviously, we want local councils to be as pragmatic and flexible as possible so that people can avoid public transport, if possible. OK, lots of uh, questions coming t into us uh, about um, education. Here's one from uh, William with the changes ahead for the next few weeks. Why would you send uh, reception and year one children to school when they would be the more difficult pupils to keep to a two metre distance? He's talking, of course, about four and five year olds. Well, we're going to be publishing more guidance on this shortly, and the, health, the, the Education Secretary will be answering questions on that. But the advice that we've had uh, is that getting those youngest children back to school is important because this is a critical year in their development, and having some weeks back at school before the summer holidays will help to set them up well for the future at a really formative stage of their education. But we're going to be working with schools to make sure that it's planned well managed, that class sizes are appropriate and that the teachers above all feel confident going back to work and have all the advice and the protective okay. equipment if necessary. On parents' confidence, Suzanne asks, can uh, someone please answer why the government wishes to open schools before reopening Parliament? Our children are not your guinea pigs. What's your response? Briefly, please, if you will, Robert. Well, Parliament is sitting in a socially distanced way. We're not uh, forcing members of Parliament to come back who don't feel able to or who are shielding because they're elderly or vulnerable. But uh, those who can are able to go back in a socially distanced way. 
We know from the scientific evidence that children uh, have the lowest risk uh, of getting unwell as a result of the virus. And so they are one of the safest groups to return to settings. Uh, but obviously, we need to ensure that teachers are properly protected. And that's an important piece of work now that yep. we're doing with schools ahead of the reopening. That is concerning lots of teachers and unions. A final question for you. A lot of questions uh, that we've discussed have been uh, concerning the changes, all of them really, in England. Keith wants to know, why do we have different rules from all the home nations? The public of the UK don't now have clear rules. He says it seems that uh, the government, you are playing politics with our lives. Briefly, your response, please, Robert. Well, our strong preference is for the whole UK to move as one. We think that's simplest, so we want a coherent and consistent message across the UK. But devolution does mean that the legal changes that underpin uh, these rules are done at different, uh, at the level of different uh, executives, whether that's in Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland. And so what we're trying to do with the UK government is to work as closely as possible with politicians in all of those parts of the union so wherever we can, this is done together and the public are given the simplest and clearest message. And we'll keep on doing that in the weeks ahead. Robert Jenrick, thank you. Listening to that was Dr Sarah Jarvis. Good evening to you. Let's focus on a couple of other changing issues, starting with face coverings. Kathleen asks, how do you wear a face mask? She says, I see so many people wearing a mask that doesn't cover their noses and only covers the mouth. Yep, and we see people covering, using face masks and then dipping them down under their chins. And that doesn't work either. It needs to cover your face um, from your nose and your mouth. It does not work really to protect you against the virus, certainly not cloth coverings. We should be wearing cloth coverings rather than official face masks, the, the, the bought ones, because those are needed for our healthcare workers. But if you are going to wear one, it does need to cover your face, uh, your nose and your mouth. And what we recommend that you do, if you do want to make one, is to use a T-shirt about eight inches across there, cut right the way across, cut a gap in it, and that will cover your nose and mouth with two layers of material that you can't see through, so that's easier for, to trap the virus. And then you tie it around the back. You must take it on, put it on, and take it off really carefully so that you're not touching your face. Put it in a plastic bag till you can wash it, and wash it at 60 degrees. OK, get stitching uh, on the issue of masks. Here's another one from Chris. Advise whether microwaving material face masks would kill the viral bug. Over to you. Well, this probably came from a study a few years ago, which suggests that microwaving dishcloths for two minutes would remove 99.9% .9 of bacteria. Nobody's done the studies, as far as I'm aware, on COVID-19, but similar viruses they've checked and a three minute microwave does destroy them. However, I have to say, I do not recommend it. There have been cases of people setting their kitchen alight when they've microwaved dishcloths. So I would strongly suggest either boiling water or at least 60 degree water in a pan or simply in the washing machine. Message understood. Uh, Emma says, what is the new guidance to all the over 70s and people told to shield for 12 weeks? Are these individuals now allowed out for exercise. Big difference between over 70s generally who are fit and well and people who are shielding who may be under 70. People who are shielding are people with specific health conditions who are in the most vulnerable group and I'm afraid for them the rules have not changed. It is still stay inside your home. Do not leave your house and garden even to go for a walk. But if you're a healthy over 70 year old in particular, the regulations have always been not shielding, but strict social distancing. So if you can go outside for a walk without coming within two metres of anyone else, that's fine. OK, let's hear from Ade now on what he can and can't do. Hi, I'm 70. I'm on lockdown. I have an appointment for an eye test at my local hospital. Should I attend? What's your advice for Ade and others like him? Well, Ade, it rather depends on whether or not you're shielding, but either way, I would suggest you get in touch 
with your hospital first, because if you're having an eye appointment, it's highly likely they will need to see you. A lot of appointments can be done either by telephone or video consultation with hospitals. They've been doing a lot of that recently. But with eyes, you'll usually need your eyes looked at with special machinery. I would suggest you give them a ring. Hospitals are now starting to ramp up their non-urgent procedures. And of course, with eyes in particular, if, say, the pressure inside your eye is too high, that can be dangerous. So you may well need to go. If they say you need to go, it's because the risk to your eyes of not going is greater than the risk to your health of going. Dr. Sarah Jarvis, thank you. We'll be back in a few minutes with Chris, who's standing by uh, to answer your questions on furloughing, fishing and fetching belongings from university. We look at the new app trying to stop the spread of coronavirus and... Don't do it. Don't cut your hair. Don't cut your hair. Just wait. Hairdressing from home, the stylist still helping her clients with their lockdown locks.
back. Many of you want to know more about the new NHS app that aims to stop the spread of the virus that's now on trial on the Isle of Wight. Here's a guide. We will soon be urged to download the government's COVID-19 smartphone app to protect the NHS and save lives. So how does it work and are there any concerns? The app is designed to keep track of the coronavirus in the community and prevent a resurgence as lockdown is eased. It uses Bluetooth to detect when people's phones are close to each other for a certain period of time. If a user develops symptoms or tests positive for the virus, they tell the app. An anonymous alert is then sent to anyone they have been in close contact with. Those users may then isolate or get tested, stopping the spread. The app will also help the NHS monitor how the virus moves and pick out hotspots. When it comes to self-reporting symptoms, the government is relying on honesty, but says it will look out for patterns of unusual behaviour to stop malicious activity. For it to work, millions of us will need to use it, but many have raised privacy concerns. The UK's app is centralised, meaning data is sent to a central computer server. Some other countries are developing decentralised apps, meaning data is only sent between phones. The government stresses that the app is safe. They say it's voluntary, doesn't store personal information, and that all data collected is anonymous and secure. It is time now for Chris Choi. Uh, look, still lots of concern about job losses and the furlough scheme. Here's an example from Emma. She asks, if lockdown goes on for a while longer, with, will the 80% furlough scheme be extended after June? Yeah, a lot of concerns about the future of this gigantic government scheme. Uh, we, we expect it to continue. Um, it started in March with a four-month time span. Uh, the Chancellor has said there'll be no cliff-edge Ending, but it may well change, particularly look out for alterations to how much, what percentage of salary the government will put in. And there could be an announcement on that as, as soon as tomorrow. OK, uh, keep your eye out for that. Lots uh, in about students too. Lisa wants to know, are we allowed to travel back to my son's accommodation to collect all his belongings? He came home from university at the beginning of lockdown. Yeah, students have had it bad. A lot of uncertainty about their accommodation, about the courses. Sadly, in this case, using private transport is still meant to be for essential journeys. I doubt that picking up belongings will qualify as that. So look for another solution, maybe get the landlord to hang on to the belongings or put them into storage, something like that. OK, um, what about uh, travelling around England now from Angie? She says, are we able to travel to another county to a holiday home. Well, lucky Angie, she has a holiday home to go to, but unlucky, you can't go and stay in them at the moment. Interestingly, of course, if you're in England now, you can move into another county, but that is for exercise, not to stay. And remember, elsewhere in the UK, the guidelines remain that you should be exercising close to home. So careful about going into an area with different rules. OK, uh, we can do more things in England in terms of sporting activities. Paul has got a question. He wants to know how soon can we start camping and fishing, whether they're combined or not? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it sounds quite an adventure. Uh, camping, I'm afraid, is out. We, we shouldn't be travelling to campsites at the moment. On fishing, if you're in England, good news for the anglers, bad news for the fish, in that from Wednesday they can start their hobby again. Elsewhere, though, that's not the case. Uh, so places like Scotland and Wales are specifying the exercise encompassing those things that we know, the walking, the running and the cycling, certainly not fishing. OK, Mandy wants to know, when uh, will dentists be allowed to e open again? Uh, Mandy's got a broken tooth. It's not a good time to have a broken tooth, is no. it? There is no firm timetable for the reopening of dentists. At the moment, uh, they're running advice lines. Uh, if you're worried, call your dentist or speak to NHS 111. Uh, Maggie asks, can hairdressers start now or in June? <laughs> Neither. Neither. This keeps cropping up, doesn't it? Um, the earliest that they'll be considered for reopening is July the 4th. Remember the good old days where we worried about a, a bad hair day? Now I'm afraid it could be 
bad hair months. What a note to end on, Chris. Thank you very much as ever. And Chris will be talking weddings and other church services straight after this programme. You can join him and Dr Sarah Jarvis on the ITV News Facebook page or you can watch the Q&A on YouTube. Before that, as we've just been hearing, it'll be some weeks before you can get your hair cut by a professional. So let's meet the hairdresser who's still styling from her sofa. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Arake and I am a mobile hairstylist from South London. And thank God for technology, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> so at the moment we're offering one-to-one um, -one virtual consultations via Zoom. How's your natural hair regime been going? One thing about this is that I've had clients from Australia, America, request a one-to-one -one service with Rachel Arake, which I'm just like, I never would have imagined prior to COVID. I would always recommend, um, you know, using a primer for your hair. If you're dying for a haircut, I would advise don't do it. Just wait, like, my, my saying is this too shall pass. Don't do it, don't cut your hair, don't cut your hair. For me, the best bit would be spending quality time with my family. I think I've bought every board game under the sun from Amazon. And my son, it's quite sad because my son actually said to me, Mommy, I love spending time with you. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my gosh. I think for me, missing, I'm missing my client. I feel like you definitely have to move with the time. There's no way you can say, you know, you're not going to elevate your business to be digital. Thanks for having me, guys. Take care and stay safe. Bye. Thanks for joining us, Rachel, and thanks for all your questions as ever. Join us online for more tonight or back here at 8 next Monday. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Line. I'm joined by Chris Choi and Dr. Sarah Jarvis. Uh, Chris, if I can start with you, we promised uh, some uh, questions on weddings and church services because we've had loads on uh, weddings. On this issue of religion, Sue and David ask, when can we attend our church services? Social distancing will not be a problem. Well, yeah, we've now had a clarification of the last 24 hours that government will consider reopening places of worship from July the 4th, so a long way to go. The difficulty here is social distancing, just like things like cinemas and theatres. Many of, of those establishments, the physical buildings, will make social distancing difficult. So there's um, a fairly intense consultation going on at the moment to work out how this can go forward. Yeah, I guess it's about the entrances and exits as well as when you get inside. Um, Samantha and Lewis ask, is it safe to say weddings planned for May and June are now cancelled? Our wedding is uh, due on the 19th of June with over 100 guests. The venue has been insisting it is still going ahead. Oh, isn't it just terrible? And, and it is the awful uncertainty for couples like this, and especially when venues are holding off cancelling the actual bookings. Uh, and even if they're allowed to rebook, it's often very difficult because the same dates next year will have already been taken uh, by other couples. Of course, the, uh, the, the wedding industry was hit very hard uh, back in March. There has been a significant 
update today. No, no real news, but government has said that it is now considering looking at how small weddings can happen in the future, and they're hoping to make some kind of announcement by the start of June. Now, whether this wedding will fit under small, especially with 140 guests, who knows? We'll have to see the detail of that, and many couples will be looking out for, for that information. Imagine the phone calls when you have to shrink your guest list. To a handful. Ouch. Um, Dr Sarah Jarvis, we've had uh, loads of questions, as you can expect, uh, for you. Let's cover a few of them. Uh, let's start with one about animals. Um, this one is from Ian. Good evening. If our dog was patted by somebody with the virus and then ran back to us and we patted it, could we catch the virus that way? Our animals uh, are our pets, contaminated surfaces like bits of plastic and, and uh, door handles. Well, theoretically, Ian, they are. However, animal fur is a fairly porous material, and that means that the virus is probably going rather to stick to it in the same way that in the early days, before we told everyone to self-isolate if they had symptoms, we said cough or sneeze into your arm because the material would absorb some of the material some of the virus. So theoretically, somebody could, if they were infected, deposit virus on your dog's surface and then you could pick it up again. But really, the risk is pretty small. What I would say, however, is that with dogs, as with everything else, it's scrupulous hand washing because, of course, even if you picked it up in your hand, you would only then contract it if you then touched your eyes, your nose or your mouth. Opal has uh, our first question tonight about testing. Let's have a listen to this. I was recently very unwell with coronavirus symptoms, but nearly three weeks after I first felt sick, I tested negative. Is it possible to have a false negative result? Is it, Sarah? It is technically possible to have a false negative result, but probably more likely is that that original test which you had, which was so-called a PCR test, the have I got it test, was negative because you are no longer infectious. You are no longer shedding virus. We know that the time when people shed the virus tends to be from about two to three days before they get symptoms to up to a week after they develop symptoms. Some people who become very poorly will shed for longer, but a lot of people will stop being infectious then even if they still have a cough. So if you had a negative test three weeks after your symptoms started, it may simply be because there was no more virus in your upper airways. Let's focus uh, on the other tests now. Julie asks, how close are we to seeing an antibody test to see if we've had COVID-19? Julie, I wish I knew. <laughs> so the government did a few weeks ago buy up three and a half million tests and ordered 17 and a half million, but then got them here only to discover that basically they weren't fit for purpose. And the most important thing was that they were telling some people that they'd had it when in fact they hadn't. Now that could be very dangerous if people assumed that they were immune. So it's back to the drawing board for them. They're trying to develop a homegrown one, which can be used at home. There is an accurate antibody test, but it has to be done in a laboratory. It's called an ELISA test, and it's going to be very difficult to roll that out. What the government's still relying on is that they'll be able to develop one, which will be a blood prick test, a little bit like a pregnancy test, and it'll tell you yourself when you're at home. OK, Sharika has a question about immunity that you probably won't be able to answer, given what you've just said, but let's have a listen, because it is concerning a lot of people. If you had the virus and recovered, can you still carry it and pass it on? Sarah. Mm. Well, we're not absolutely certain. I think that's part of the problem. We think, looking at other viruses, that once you've had it, you do develop antibodies. And we think it's likely that those antibodies will give you some immunity, but may not give you complete immunity. It may be that if you have a mild case, you're less immune than if you've had a severe case. And we certainly don't know how long that immunity lasts. But from other coronaviruses, we know that they provide some degree of protection, at least for at least a few months. That's the best we can say, because it hasn't been around for long enough. Charlotte wants to know, has our status in the UK as uh, the most obese country in Europe had a bearing on the death rates here? That's a really tough one, Charlotte. There are lots and lots of factors that increase your risk of severe complications. So, for instance, if you are in the obese category with a body mass index between 30 and 35, and that's the ratio of your height to weight, and obesity starts at 
35, at 30, and morbid obesity or severe obesity is above 40. If it's between 30 and 35, you're about 30% more likely to die from coronavirus. If it's above 40, you're more than twice as likely to die. However, if, for instance, you're of South Asian or Afro-Caribbean origin, then you're almost twice as likely to die from it. If, for instance, you have uncontrolled diabetes, you're more than twice as likely to die as somebody who is otherwise in good health. And of course, really importantly, the older you are, the more likely, unfortunately, you are to um, have serious complications. So it's a factor, but it's certainly not the whole picture. Given what we now know about the virus in terms of the data and the death rates, both here and abroad, should the government be considering changing who's on the shielded list if you are, as you've described, in one of those categories who are, who are more at risk? I certainly think that they should be considering looking at who is on the high risk categories, but I think they are not as likely as the shielded categories. Um, so on its own, for instance, people with diabetes, people who have morbid, who are severe, severely obese, that's a medical term, I apologise, morbid obesity, it's body mass index over 40, they're already in the high risk group, but they're not in the shielded group or the highest risk group. But what's happened is that GPs have been given the ability to put people onto the shielded list if they think they're particularly vulnerable. And I would say somebody who, for instance, had, say, uncontrolled diabetes and poorly controlled asthma, or who was very obese and had diabetes, I might consider putting them on the shielded list if they had several factors which added together to increase your sensitivity or your vulnerability. OK, interesting. So GPs have that power to uh, change the people on that list going forward when we all start to get out and about and mingle a bit more. Um, Annette has a question now about heat. Hello. Weeks ago, it was stated that the virus would die down with high temperatures. Is there any evidence that a good summer could kill off COVID-19? What's your answer? <sighs> Annette, I wish there were. Unfortunately, we have seen the virus very much taking hold in hotter countries, so Brazil and many of the South Asian countries. So there's no question we're not going to get rid of this in the summer. We have seen with previous coronaviruses, one of the previous epidemics, things died down a bit in the summer. Another one, it didn't so much. So it's definitely not going to go away on its own, no matter what Donald Trump said. He believes that it's going to miraculously disappear over the summer. This may have come about because, firstly, ultraviolet light affects how much the virus survives and secondly heat over 60 degrees does kill it but we're not going to be having that in the UK it might die down a bit but it's certainly not going away all right a final question uh, from Pete he says can the virus enter the body through the ears or small cuts or cracks in the skin great question it's a great question, Pete, and I'm very pleased to say that as far as we're aware, the answer is no. It has to get in through the mucosa, which is a, a particularly sensitive thin bit of the, the lining of the body that it can penetrate. And that is your eyes, your nose or your mouth. So clearly, if you've got a cut, you want to keep it well covered. But no, it shouldn't get in through your ears. The skin in there is not the toughest, but it's tough enough to keep it out. OK, Dr Sarah Jarvis, as ever, thank you for joining us this evening and uh, at least getting through some of the questions that are coming into us uh, uh, from all of uh, the viewers with so many concerns about so many issues right now, which is completely understandable. Um, let's uh, bring Chris Choi back in. Um, I mean, we've just had so many different small tweaks in the last 24 hours that we're all catching up with all of this. Um, Sarah wants to know, I am a residential cleaner. After yesterday's announcement, I remain confused as to if I should return to work or not. The message was encouraging people who can't work from home to go back to work. But does this include going into other people's houses? Cleaners, um, childcare nannies, plumbers, any handyman, handywoman, you know, what's the situation? Sarah's quite right. There, there is some confusion about this slight modification, this shift. However, when it comes to residential cleaners that are going to people's homes, the government did specify that they could go back to work in England, but there are some really important provisos. They have to be sure that they can enforce social distancing in, in what is their workplace, is somebody else's home. Also, they need to make sure that there's nobody in the house that is shielding or self-isolating. And certainly, 
if either Sarah or any of her customers are showing any symptoms, then she shouldn't be going into their home. So, you know, within those kind of guidelines, it is possible now for these cleaners to think about going back to work, but they, they, don't, they shouldn't feel forced and they should only go when it is safe to do so and when it is possible to do it on those very specific terms. And pull out if that situation changes from houses um, to homes. Kirsty says... Uh, the Prime Minister stated that if you cannot go to work from home, then go to work. How does this affect driving instructors? How are they supposed to return to work when they have to keep two metres apart? They can't really, can they? You, you can't be teaching somebody to drive two metres away from them. And the general background information here uh, is that vehicles should only be used for essential journeys. There is, when it comes to driving instructors, quite an important exemption in that if they are giving lessons to somebody who's important for the national battle against COVID-19, that is allowed. But obviously that's quite a, a rare thing in other aspects. Instructors have sadly been told not to conduct their lessons. OK, there'll be lots more in terms of what that means for people's jobs as uh, we go forward. But for now, Chris Choi, thank you very much. Thank you to Dr Sarah Jarvis. We'll be back here next Monday at 8.30. Thank you for watching. Thank you.